Hello, welcome to Straight Talk. I want to welcome all of our new viewers and uh, just thank you all for watching. We try to touch on issues that are very important in our society. We focus a lot about drug abuse lately just because of the epidemic with heroin and other drugs has been enormous, killing 66,000 Americans. But there's a population that we forget to talk about, and it's the LGBT community. And so today on Straight Talk, it's a very special show because I think it's important when we talk about this issue and learn as much as we can. And joining me is Tyler Howard, who works at a Maryland Addiction Recovery Center as a therapist. Mm -hmm. And we're very happy to have you here. Thank you very much. The LGBT community has a, a kind of a history of using more drugs yeah. than the regular general population. Mm -hmm but more difficult to get into treatment. Yeah. So it's a real scary situation that I think the general public doesn't quite understand. So let's, yeah. let's talk a little bit, we've got plenty of time to kind of get into this. Uh, let's talk about it. Tell Certainly. me about yourself, because I know you were using drugs, yep. you're gay, uh -huh. and so you know, you lived all lived the barriers the that are there. So, so talk a little bit about that. Certainly. Um, I mean, we've certainly made strides in just the past decade alone where there's more media attention on, you know, trans rights, marriage equality, many issues that the gay community finds important. Um, unfortunately, the health disparities really hasn't made headlines as much as it should. Um, you know, personal experience, um, I knew that I was gay in high school. Um, you know, unfortunately, I grew up in a, a very, very conservative county in Texas. And so along with that came a lot of um, like internalized hatred, very low self-esteem. Um, we as a country, while we're improving in the way we talk about LGBT people and the way we treat them, um, overall being LGBT, it's, it's not an identity or a label that encourages self-esteem. And so with that comes a lot of drug and alcohol use to self-medicate um, and I found that living, you know, in a very homophobic region of the United States, um, in addition to having very few media representations of what, you know, healthy LGBT cultural identity looked like, what healthy relationships looked like, um, unfortunately, that that drove me down a, a pretty dark path, and I'm very thankful to have eventually found my way back, um, and and I can now use my experiences to help other um, LGBTQ people, whether they're out of the closet or still in, um, receive the appropriate treatment they deserve. Now for you, mm -hmm. you ended up drinking, smoking pot, yes. taking meth, yep. taking some you know, And that was, was it more for the pain you were in mm -hmm. or was it just coping with being a gay person in a community that did not want to accept that? Yes, yes, and yes, <laughs> all of the above. I think um, in my personal experience for me, um, it, it was really to overcome a fear of death. And I know that sounds very dramatic um, and histrionic maybe, but um, you know, and, and just in personal experiences, I can think of two. Um, one was I was in Austin, Texas with my boyfriend. He and I were not out because you know, unfortunately. Because it was Austin, Texas. Because it's Austin, Texas. Right. I got it. Um, which is one of the more liberal cities in Texas, but we still experience this very scary situation um, where something as simple as holding hands, something that her heterosexual couples take for granted, um, almost felt like a de death sentence. We were on 4th Street, which there's a strip of um, gay bars on that street, and I'll talk a little bit more later about um, kind of the subculture and how alcohol is so ingrained mm -hmm. in, in socialization, unfortunately. Um, we made our way over to 6th Street, which is where the, the straight bars, so to say, were. And, you know, I, I had drank a lot of alcohol to feel confident about myself, to overcome that really low self-esteem that comes from having a marginalized cultural identity. Um, and, you know, I just remember feeling proud and feeling like I deserve to express my love for the person I'm with just as much as all of these other couples do. And unfortunately, you know, not after maybe two seconds of holding his hand, we started getting roughed up, mm. pushed, physically assaulted, verbally assaulted. And I remember our default reaction um, to, to kind of overcome this 
realization of our own mortality in, in a country that um, unfortunately doesn't approve or accept people like me was to run immediately back to 4th Street, go to the bars, and drink ourselves stupid. Um, so it, it's probably 50-50 for my personal experience. One, to overcome the shame and the guilt and the self-esteem issues that I internalized from um, you know, decades of being told that this is bad, this is sinful, um, this is morally corrupt, and also 50% just you know, dealing with, with issues of safety and concern for um, how am I going to have a healthy, happy, successful life when so many people in this world are determined to make life hell for me. Yeah. It, it's, uh, you said we're making progress. We are making progress. But I think people still don't understand that even percentages, Yeah. when we talk, from, from, you can name the drug, mm -hmm. but the LGBT community has a much higher rate Skyrocket. when you compare that to the general population. Yeah. And, it, and all the things you mentioned in your life were probably the, the reasons mm -hmm. that that's happening on a national and international level. Yeah, in the uh, psychology and counseling field, we talk about an intergenerational transmission of trauma. And so within a family system, and I'm talking about like traditional mom, dad, children, we find that when the parents have experienced some sort of trauma, um, PTSD, sexual assault, um, physical assault, what have you, um, we see that, um, that this stress and this uh, PTSD can often get transmitted down um, through the family unit. And that's through genetics, but it's also through behaviors. Um, the gay community in, in many ways and the LGBTQ larger queer community is like a family. And if we think about the decades and centuries um, in America alone where LGBT people are disproportionately the victims of um, you know, lynchings and, and assaults and assassinations and hate crimes, and then we talk about the HIV epidemic and the lack of response from our government, um, you know, of, of course it makes sense that young LGBT people today are hearing these stories from um, our elders, so to say, and just seeing how the people before us have been so disserviced by the healthcare field. Um, it's really disheartening and discouraging for younger LGBT people to get their own help. Yeah, no, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And, and it's interesting how we are now generational. We're, we're into mm -hmm. a new generation, yeah. second generation, third generation, and and you hope things get better, especially in the drug and alcohol world. Absolutely. Because we're, here we're talking about uh, an epidemic in this country that's killing you know, tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And we're all included in that. All the different groupings, whether I don't care whether you're LGBT or male, Absolutely. female, or black or white. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not discriminating against anybody. Not at all. Now, you're now a counselor. I am, yes. So you're seeing some of this stuff Right at front. What do you what are you seeing at, at this point? What do, what do you see coming into your your mm -hmm. drug center? You know, at Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, I'd say that um, we're just shocked at, at the number of new patients that are coming in, who you know, after they build rapport with us and, and after I've developed some some sense of trust, um, they come out and share that they're, you know, either identifying as LGBTQ or mm -hmm. questioning their identity. Um, and even just in the proportional makeup of our, our patient caseload, the number of LGBTQ identifying or questioning patients, um, it, it's just insanely disproportional compared to, in the general population, the number of people that identify as LGBTQ. I mean, I would imagine that, that you're a phenomenal counselor because of what you've Appreciate been through. That. So we're going to take a little break. Certainly. I, I appreciate your honesty your story, and it's going to help a lot of people. I guarantee it. So hang in there. We're going to keep you here the whole show. Sounds good. When we come back to Straight Talk, we're going to continue our conversation about drug addiction, the LGBT community. We're talking with Tyler Howard, who's doing amazing work, and we'll keep our discussion going. So stay with us. We're coming right back to Straight Talk. Who helps a hero? Who tells the story of their scars? The freedom and safety of so many, of us all, is earned by the sacrifices of so few. Who helps a hero? We all do. 
The Gary Sinise Foundation works to support America's defenders and strengthen their families through entertainment, the construction of smart homes for our wounded heroes, and by inspiring and educating others to also support the veterans within their own communities. We enjoy the benefits of their sacrifice and service each day. Now it's time we serve them. Find out how you can help our heroes at GarySiniseFoundation.org. While we can never do enough to show our gratitude to our nation's defenders, we can always do a little more. Calls me googly eyes. You know you're beautiful, right? You know that? Even you are beautiful. I got bullied for wearing glasses. Share if you're against bullying. We put it out there, just took off. Three million people have shared this post. Don't let bullies get you down. I stand with you. Our whole family's wearing glasses. I wear glasses and I'm proud. I even have the army on my team. All the kind comments brought my child joy. I don't feel thank you is enough. Thank you. Hi, welcome back to Straight Talk. I want to, again, welcome all of our new viewers from our new cities that we're in and let you know that we're talking about a very important topic here, and it's drug and alcohol addiction and the LGBT community. And with us is Tyler Howard, who is a drug counselor. He's also been through it himself, mm -hmm. being a gay man who was also hooked on alcohol and drugs and yep. went through the whole thing. So, again, thank you for sharing your story. When you went to get help, because mm -hmm. you went to college, you were probably later on. When you, how did you know you needed help mm -hmm. to begin with? And when you did, what, what did you find? Did you find help available or nothing? That's a great question. Um, and to be very honest with you, I've only recently accepted help um, for this problem. And that's kind of a function of, of how LGBTQ people are discouraged from mm -hmm. accessing the, the resources that they need when they, they do speak up and they ask for help. Um, I remember uh, when I was an undergrad, um, I experienced a situation that in, involved drugs and alcohol, and um, you know through that experience, I experienced uh, sexual assault. Mm. And I remember knowing that I deserved help, and, and being in the psychology field, I, I knew how important it was to get counseling, get testing, and, and make sure that I was healthy and, and that I could grow from this and, and grow stronger from this. And I remember going to the uh, doctor, to the clinic, um, and letting them know what my situation was, asking for help, finding resources for counseling, for, for drug and, and marijuana abuse, and being told by the nurse that this was a teachable moment from God, that she almost hoped that I had contracted HIV, um, and that, yeah, shocking, right? And really? this, is, this is a trained nurse, wow. um, mind you. And while she said that she felt empathy for me and she felt sorry that I experienced this event, it was more that she was sorry that I, you know, was comfortable in, in sharing my identity and that it was a, a sexual assault by a man on myself. And, you know, despite, and I think that's the power of the stigmatization of the LGBTQ community, because despite being in the field, and knowing how important it was for me to, to practice resiliency and, and get the help I needed and deserved, I let that experience keep me from getting help for years. Um, it's one of those not practicing what you preach moments, sure. but as a counselor, I was terrified of going to counseling. I was terrified of, of talking about my experience to anybody because it had been shut down so devastatingly um, the first time I ever opened my mouth to, to get help. When you think about the LGBTQ community, on top of experiences of assault and on top of experiences with drug and alcohol abuse, there's the added layer of individuals who aren't able to talk to their families um, in order to access the financial and logistical resources that are needed to get help. Um, so 
part of it was an unwillingness on my part to um, receive that same homophobia and hatred and, and disgust that I did with that experience. But part of it was just logistically, I felt like I couldn't talk to my parents because admitting what had happened to me, admitting that I was relying on marijuana and alcohol to um, you know, moderate my emotions and, and numb myself from the experience I had, um, I knew that that would necessitate coming out to them. And I couldn't imagine, you know, my worst fear was that on top of losing my sense of autonomy and my, my sense of personal safety, I would also lose the family that I love so much. Sure. Um, now, Which thankfully, that wasn't is the experience. Extremely common. Very, it has very to common. Be one of the top areas of, of concern and fear Absolutely. of anyone in the community. Yeah. And, you know, the studies that we've read in, in the drug and alcohol treatment world show that even LGBTQ children who live in, in moderately disapproving households, so that's not outright hatred and homophobia. That's parents um, being uncomfortable talking about the, the subject or changing the channel when um, a gay couple is represented. They're 1.5 to three times more likely to abuse alcohol and marijuana. Um, and that's the moderately disapproving parents. Uh, you have to imagine that in the US, there's a lot of families that are on the higher end of, of disapproving where they might be outwardly saying um, very hateful and spiteful comments towards um, LGBTQ identifying peoples. When you finally reached that point where you were, again, mm -hmm. after a horrible experience, mm -hmm. can't believe that nurse did that, uh, to get some help for yourself, yeah. was it different? Was it better? So much better. And, so much and better. where was that? At a local counseling center? Mm -hmm. or was it just some place that understood? Yeah. So. You know, thankfully in our field and with the um, introduction of technology in counseling, um, I was able to kind of put my, my toe in the water, so to say. Um, and while this um, mode of counseling isn't as effective, um, e-counseling, so getting counseling over the internet mm -hmm. where you don't have to show your face, you don't have to um, get super vulnerable at a, a very fast pace, you can access help through iMessaging or through calls or through text message. Um, that was kind of a, an introductory experience um, and a, a healthy relearning about the field that I love so much and the field that I'm in doesn't necessarily have to fail me, that, that there are people out there that do accept and, and are not judgmental and understanding. So you, did, so you got some help over the internet. I did, and then that encouraged to, me to, to take, make take a leap of faith. make you feel comfortable. Yes. That led me to take a leap of faith, and I found a local counseling center um, with a, a very affirming and, and loving and, and non-judgmental counselor, which is what all counselors like me aspire to be. Um, unfortunately, I just let my previous experience with that one healthcare provider flavor and, and poison my perception of other healthcare providers. Sure. And that's happening on a daily, hourly, minute basis with other LGBTQ people who are seeking help um, because of assault experiences or because of alcohol, drug addiction, um, or because of a combination of both, which unfortunately in the uh, community is very common. I would assume that you are a, a large, big advocate for training of counselors. Very much so, very <laughs> I much so. I would think so. That, that you feel that that's very important. Yeah. Are we doing that, you, since now you are in the field, mm -hmm. Are you able to do that, help with that, or are you seeing that happen more? I'm seeing that happen. Um, I can speak a little bit about the counseling field in general, but I can speak more specifically about what Maryland Addiction Recovery Center is mm -hmm. doing um, on our end. Um, as far as the American Counseling Association goes, we have a wonderful LGBTQ subdivision um, that I'm a member of, and we get um, weekly emails and monthly resources on um, different ways that we can more culturally competently um, you know, uh, counsel the, the uh, stigmatized minority. Um, we also at Mark, I'm very thankful that we've hired a several LGBT yeah. staff members so that I can use my experience to help inform and staff. That, and, that's, and, that, and that's critical. Yeah. We're going to take another little break and then we're going to come back with you because I just uh, fascinated and, and appreciate so much that you're here Thank telling you. your story because I just know it's going to help a lot of people. We're talking with Tyler Howard, who uh, uh, is a gay man who
He was in recovery from alcohol and drugs, now working in the field and educating us and hopefully educating you about the LGBTQ community and their barriers and difficulties in getting help. And hopefully we can help a lot of people here. So stay with us. We're coming right back. We're going to keep talking with Tyler. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? <laughs> B, console her? Don't worry, sweetie. This is going to happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. It's a short ride from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Find fun activities to do, like boating and biking, or camping and hiking, plus much more. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. Don't allow your weight to threaten your health or control your future. Excess weight or obesity can cause emotional and physical health risks, but you can take control. The Your Weight Matters campaign offers free resources and tips to help you measure and understand your weight. Take the Your Weight Matters Challenge. The free toolkit prepares you to speak with a healthcare provider about your weight. Your weight does matter. Take the challenge and take control today. Hello, welcome back to Straight Talk. We're talking about a very important issue and that's drug and alcohol addiction in the LGBTQ community where the resources aren't there, there's a lot of bias, a lot of prejudice that stops people from getting help. And at this stage of the game, we need to find help for everybody, regardless. And I think it's important. And joining us, sharing his own story, is Tyler Howard. Tyler, thanks for hanging in there thanks for this for show. Uh, it's very, very gracious of you to do that and, and share your story. <laughs> we were talking about what do we need to do Teenagers, yes, who are, are either not sure of their identity, or they are sure, mm -hmm. and they know what what they want with their life. But as you say before, as you found, a lot of prejudice, a lot of fear, yeah, and not no, no acceptance. The whole thing. What what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. We talked about a little bit about training of counselors, but you were talking about resources that are specifically for the LGBTQ community. Absolutely. So when we're thinking about um, younger kids, teenagers, adolescents, um, it's really about communicating that the household is a loving, accepting, and, and open place to talk about these feelings, um, talking about these identity issues and, and this exploration. And that's crucial for parents to do, whether or not they personally agree um, or accept the LGBTQ community. Um, there's a way that um, all parents, regardless of how they feel about gay, lesbian, trans, and bi people can ensure that, that their children has the highest likelihood of experiencing and, and building up the resiliency to this minority stress um, that they experience on a daily basis from the media and bullying in schools, um, you know, from their own family members um, who might be communicating some sort of internalized hatred uh, towards the LGBTQ community. Um, and really, first and foremost, it's just being able to talk about all of the same issues that one would talk about with their straight child. Um, and so that's, that's not shying away from the topics of healthy relationships, not shying away from topics of sex, not shying away from encouraging um, your child to, to build friendships and connect with other people who are like them. Um, in doing so, you, you unfortunately set your child up for failure and that they're gonna go out into the real world and um, 
you know, unfortunately gay, straight alike, there's predatory people out there who take advantage of, of um, naivety, so to say, and they might set up the expectation that all relationships in the gay community are like this. You know, all sexual experiences involve drugs and alcohol. It makes it more fun. Um, by nipping that in the bud as a parent and having conversations at home about this is personal autonomy, this is your bill of rights as a human, and this is how to engage in a, a very healthy, mutually satisfying relationship with someone, whether they're same sex or different sex. Right. Um, we protect them from uh, being preyed on by those unfortunate individuals that exist out there. And when you add in the addiction, yes, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or heroin, as we're seeing everywhere that's, that's going on, mm -hmm. it makes it more life-threatening. Absolutely. Because you don't have time to have prejudice. Mm -hmm. If your son is overdosing or hooked on a hard drug, you've got to get him help. You have to get them help. Or if it's a spouse or if it's a, a relative, we, we have to mm -hmm. primarily get them into treatment. Yes. That's the most critical thing we're not doing in the general population. Yeah. We're not getting people into treatment as, as quickly as we need to. They mm -hmm. overdose, fine, bring them back to life with Narcan, Mm -hmm. but get them into treatment or they're going to do it again. Absolutely. And there's an unfortunate tendency for parents to equate, my son is gay, and because of that, he's a drug addict now. And that's not the case. Being LGBTQ does not make you a drug user. Unfortunately, I see a lot of patients who are afraid to come out to their family because they don't want their family to know that in the context of being in addiction treatment, that, oh, also, by the way, um, I'm gay because right. they don't want their parents to artificially connect the two. But we're talking about, in general, mm -hmm. being supportive. Yes. Creating a supportive environment and getting help, mm -hmm. whether it's your own child, your spouse, your friends, regardless of what their sexual preference is. Yeah. The bottom line is we've got people dying out there and we need to get them help. Yes. And I cannot thank you enough for not only coming on here and sharing your story, but everything that you're doing, now that you're in the field, uh -huh. you're able to help a lot of people and you've already talked about their comfortability in working with you as a counselor and I'm hoping that that will grow. So again, thank you very, very much for being on the show. Thanks for letting Appreciate me share my story. It. Appreciate it. Love it. Thank you for watching Straight Talk. I want to thank Tyler. Hopefully we all learn something from this show and we will work to be better people and be more accepting and more loving because people need help and it's our job. Thank you for watching Straight Talk and we'll see you next time. Hi, welcome to Straight Talk.